Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Pat Christmas here, Chief Policy Officer with the Committee of 70. It is Election Day. Polls have been open for about five hours, uh, and it will stay open until 8 o'clock. Uh, of course, uh, any voter uh, in the city of Philadelphia or across the state of Pennsylvania uh, is eligible to use those voting machines uh, if they're in line by 8 o'clock. This is a massive, massive election uh, for the city of Philadelphia, but actually for across uh, many counties in, in Pennsylvania. Uh, we're electing uh, local government officials, which, of course, matter a great deal in our daily in our daily lives. Uh, as well as judicial uh, offices up and down the ballot. So uh, here at the, the Committee of 70, we are live on Studio C70 all day long, uh, speaking to folks who are working in a, a variety of different areas related to elections, democracy, uh, good government. Uh, and uh, this afternoon, uh, 12.03 here, we're speaking with Jonathan Tannen, who is the founder of the 66 uh, Wards blog, uh, which is a, a database, a, a data, a data based data driven blog uh, for democracy and election related issues uh, here in the city of Philadelphia. So, Jonathan, uh, thank you so much for uh, joining us. Thanks for having me, Pat. All right. Well, why don't we start with this? So how did you how did you get into politics locally here in Philly? And then where did the where did the blog come from? Yeah. Um, so I grew up in West Philly. This is home. Um, and it really came out of some energy after 2016. I think a lot of us found ourselves with some energy trying to think about uh, what we could do um, to help free and fair elections. Um, and I'm someone who has some data skills. So I was like, hey, I know how to download a data set and make some plots. Um, so I started in, in the 2017, November of 2017, I um, did some analyses on turnout and uh, looking at election results. Um, and I decided to create a blog. So 66 Wards was born and uh, the rest is history. Right. And, and you, you cover uh, a number of different topics, uh, again, just just here in Philly, elections related to kind of, you know, pol politics uh, you know, related. Uh, and given that today is uh, Election Day, uh, one of the most uh, interesting and closely watched uh, pieces or features of your of your of your blog website uh, is the turnout tracker. Uh, and I know you've, you've, you've done this for a number of, of cycles now and you've, you've improved upon it uh, cycle by cycle. So break break this down. How does it work? Uh, number one. And then also number two. Uh, how can folks contribute to the tracker and make sure we get a good, good solid uh, estimate uh, later today? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, the story of the turnout tracker is um, in 2018, I had my new blog and I found a Facebook group where people were posting like, hooray, I live in 2714 and I was the 10th voter at, at 10 a.m. And I was like, wow, there's some really great data here. We're seeing like this number go up through the day and we can adjust it for how many people usually vote and we can get a sense like, oh, 50% of the people that usually vote have voted or 150% of the people who usually vote have voted. So um, I decided to make a form rather than people just posting it on their social media, they could actually submit it to my form. I then download the data, I do some statistics, I, I adjust it for where, um, for which wards tend to vote similarly and which wards tend to vote differently from each other. Um, and I come up with a, a estimate of how many people have, have currently voted across the city. And, produce this little purple line on my site that you can you can watch go up through the day. Mm -hmm. um, so I need that the data all comes from from citizens, all comes from people who vote and, and decide to submit it to my form. Um, if you go to 66words.com and then click on the turnout tracker, you'll see a link there um, for where to submit your vote. You submit your vote, it's it the link, the the link that it'll direct you to is bit.ly slash 66 turnout, all one word, bit.ly slash 66 turnout. But if you go to 66words.com, you'll find the link. Yeah, awesome. And folks need to know what, what number of voter they, they were at their precinct, right? Yeah, so when you vote, you're, you'll, you'll be able to see you were the 40th person. So you tell me, oh, I was the 40th person there. And the magic of that data is because we have that, that cumulative number, you're not just giving me data on your individual vote. You're giving me the data on everyone who voted at your, your precinct before you, which is what really makes this analysis possible. Mm -hmm. Got it. And, and uh, you, you started doing this work before there was widespread mail-in widespread mail voting in Pennsylvania. Of course, uh, after 2019 and starting with the 2020 elections, uh, we have a, a large portion of, of the city, not, not actually not the majority anymore, uh, but a significant portion looks like it's around a quarter, maybe a third of the electorate, depending on the election uh, votes by mail. It looks like at that point, because you you, you get that data uh, uh, quicker than the in-person vote, you have kind of a baseline and then the, then the in-person vote kind of goes up from there. Is that basically what the graph looks like? 
Yeah, that's what the graph looks like. So we start at um, 63,000 uh, mail-in ballots had been returned uh, as of my last data uh, delivery. So um, uh, yeah, we have about 63,000 mail-in ballots. There will probably be some more that arrived um, end of the day yesterday and today. Um, and then we're watching the line go up. So as of um, noon today, I estimate that we have, an, we have about 70, 2,000 people who have um, voted in person so far. So 63,000 mail-in, we're at 72,000, so we're at about 130,000 or so people um, who have voted across the city. All right, and we have a little bit less than eight hours for folks to get out there and vote in person if you haven't done that yet, or of course, if you do have your mail-in ballot, get that thing returned in hand by, by eight o'clock you know, to a Dropbox or to a, the main elections office uh, at City Hall. Um, all right. So the other the other bit of analysis you've done uh, several times is around around ballot position. And, you know, this is one of those elections, of course, where in, in some races, at least uh, ballot uh, position, we have a rule. The common pleas court race we have here in Philly, like, you know, maybe one of those, I suppose, there are about 10 seats and 16 candidates, uh, 16 candidates who, who voters, almost all voters have never heard of before and can can barely tell uh, apart in, in, in any real way. Uh, of course, the, the, the Philadelphia and the Pennsylvania Bar Associations put out ratings. Um, but those ratings are, are entirely separate of um, how many positions are open, and they're, and they're not endorsements. They're just kind of reflecting on which which folks seem to be ready to, to sit on the bench. So uh, for these these really challenging down ballot races, uh, this thing called ballot position matters. Can you just walk us through quickly what that factor is and kind of what you found in your analysis? Yeah, absolutely. So um, so as you said, we have sixteen candidates. Those names get organized on the ballot in some way in a big rectangle. Um, a bunch of people in the first column, then a second column, then a third column. Um, and growing up, I always heard that you know, the luck of the draw, the random luck of your name getting picked, um, determining the order can, can decide who, uh, who will win. So I decided to estimate that. Um, it's really sort of a nice uh, data setup because it's all randomized. So it's sort of an, a randomized um, experiment in, in the real world. Um, and when I did the analysis, I found that luck, the luck of being in the first column tripled your votes versus being in the third or later column. So just by random luck of the draw, it, you could triple your votes by being in the first column. And that effect was stronger than the effect of being endorsed by the inquirer, was stronger than the effect of um, being endorsed by the Democratic City Committee. It was basically stronger than any other effect I found. Um, I've since tried to look at that for other races. I looked at it for um, district attorney uh, and then city council. And then I also looked at it um, for mayor, although I haven't published those results. Um, and the effect is smaller for those higher profile races. So you're right that these races where there are a ton of candidates, a ton of possible, a ton of people who can win. And then, yeah, a lot of names that that people just don't haven't heard of before um, ballot position has a huge effect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, for, you know, folks uh, at, at, here at the Committee of 70, we would, I mean, the ideal situation where, you know, every voter is able to do, do a little bit of homework. They know exactly, you know, which candidate uh, has a certain agenda or profile or, or background and then make make their uh, assessments accordingly. But, you know, in the real world, there's just there's a lot to, to vote on. Uh, actually, as first for certain conservatives, as far as we are concerned at 70, there are too many offices to vote on uh, here in Philly and here across across the state. Um, but to the extent that the ballot position probably shouldn't be a, an, an influential factor in who wins public office. Uh, I mean, what would what would be the, the solution for that uh, and, and if we could wave a magic wand? Yeah, so um, we don't need to have the same ballot order all across the city, right? So right now there's a single draw and the ballot order looks the same in every single precinct. And so I think what we could do, and I wrote up a blog post that looked at this, is we could randomize them um, between different precincts. So we could have one precinct sees one order, another precinct sees another order, another division sees another order. And within divisions, there would still be those effects but they would wash out when you averaged out across the whole city. And then we would be able to, to actually see other, other things like candidate quality, hopefully uh, rise to the top. 
Right, right, right. So, and I guess on the for election administrators, that'd be it, it adds some complications and some work on there, and to have all those different you know ballot types across across seventeen hundred divisions. But as you as you noted, it would eliminate ballot position as a, as a as a factor in the in the election. Did you also look at if not only rotating by precinct, but potentially by ward or or maybe even council district? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, so the the I I did mine by by precinct just because like that's sort of the the smallest unit, but um. But we we got essentially the same the same benefits if you were only able to to randomize by ward. Um, you know we have sixty six wards, so so just by random chance that you know, a candidate wouldn't um, wouldn't end up in the first ballot position on on too, in too many wards. Um, you could even if you really don't want to randomize it. I had one uh, analysis based on this idea of the NBA uh, draft wheel where instead of randomizing by each position, you have a fixed order. So you're in the first position in one division, then in the next division, you're in the 10th position, then you're in the seventh. And you can figure out like the optimal pattern of, of up and down to, to make sure that you get exactly zero uh, ballot position effect on average, if you really, really want to figure <laughs> it out. Yeah, well, you know, I think you may, maybe on the other side of the 2024 presidential election, once we, once we get through those here, here in the Commonwealth, uh, we'll have a better opportunity to take a look at some of these other election election issues that we will have to deal with at some point. You know, pre presuming that we don't think ballot position should be a, a dominant factor again. Who wins? Who wins public office? At least in these in these down ballot, lower information races where voters just really have a really hard time uh, telling the candidates apart. Um, all right. So uh, another um, kind of area in which you've done some some research, some analysis is trying to understand uh, the electorate, uh, and you tried to identify voting blocks. And how those voting blocks behave, kind of where they are. Can you walk us through, in, in the simplest terms, kind of like how you how you how you do that, and, and kind of what you've learned along the way? Yeah, absolutely. So um, when you look at a lot of Philadelphia election maps, you start to learn that every single map looks the same. Uh, you see parts of the city that always tend to vote similarly, and other parts of the city that always vote similarly. Um, and that showed up in my turnout tracker. That showed up in my um, uh, election night result analyses, uh, my, my blog posts, um, you always see maps where divisions tend to vote very similarly together. And I said, let me just create, let, let me codify this and create a, a set of analyses that I can do where I can group all these divisions that tend to vote similarly. Um, so I ran what we call a clustering analysis um, on the history of Philadelphia votes and with some sort of fancy bells and whistles. And I found that essentially there are four groups of divisions that all tend to vote relatively similarly together. And you can sort of turn the dial to say, oh, actually I wanna get six divisions, I wanna get 10, or I wanna get six groups, I wanna get 10 groups. You can sort of tweak how many you want and then you'll get sort of cruder or, or more uh, fine-grained um, clusters. But I liked four. Um, and one thing I like to say is, is these in this clustering, I only used historical voting results. So I looked at where what candidates won in each division. I looked at the vote for each candidate, and I looked at turnout. Importantly, I didn't use race or race or any other socio uh, socioeconomic um, information in these clusters. Mm -hmm. But when you look at the results, the results really break down um, by race and class. So that um, even though I don't use them, the end result is that. Uh, predominantly black wards tend to vote similarly and vote for similar candidates. Um, there's a group of wards that I call the wealthy progressives. That's Center City, that's University City, um, sort of the ring around Center City up in uh, Fishtown and, and, and then out in um, Chestnut Hill and Mount, and Mount Airy. And I call those the wealthy progressives. Mm -hmm. Then there's the group that I call the white moderates. Those are down in South Philly and, and those are up in the Northeast. Mm -hmm. um, those are the uh, the groups of divisions where Trump tends to do best in the city, although you know in Philadelphia, uh, Trump doesn't really win any of the division or any of the groups, but but he does his best in in South Philly and then up in the Northeast. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the fourth group is uh, Hispanic voters, um, which is really clustered in uh, North Philly um, around the seventh council district. Mm -hmm. um, and so those are the four clusters. They come out of the data. Again, I don't use race to, to identify them, but the end result is that the election results happen to be clustered by race. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and, and that's proven a really useful lens to like understand Philadelphia's elections. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess you, you, like, like you, you mentioned, it's the, the analysis is on election results. And they, they tend to track very, very closely to both race and socioeconomic class. And then when you look at the map, it, tra- it tracks very clearly along geography as well, because it's, it's a segregated city. Um, right. So those patterns just become really stark when you're looking at them uh, on uh, on that map. Um, so uh, uh, could you I mean, are you able to make make any guesses about, you know, given this particular mayoral field, uh, how you know what the map uh, and what the analysis might look like on the other side. I mean, you may, I know you may be hesitant to, to make guesses, but for example, you know, there, there are probably like several different candidates that, you know, are, you know arguably, you know, will be, will be splitting uh, one or a couple of those voting blocks. And there are probably all sorts of variations about how that's going to happen uh, today. Yeah. So I did a series I called the back of the envelope series. So I, I like to call it back of the envelope just to like really communicate how, uh, how imprecise it is. Um, yeah, but because, yeah, because and, like you would because you would be scribbling your math just be clear for viewers at home you'd be scribbling your math on the back of that you know paper envelope that old junk mail that's it's like lying yeah. on your kitchen table right so that is how rough the estimate is <laughs> thank you for that yeah um so in this election i expect about 40 percent of the votes to come from the um from the black ward cluster i expect about 30 percent to come from the wealthy progressive cluster um, 20% from the white moderate cluster and then 10% from the Hispanic cluster. So to give you sort of a sense, it's like um, the black cluster, uh, it, dominating in the black cluster might be enough for a candidate um, you know, that does well enough in the other clusters. Someone doing really, really well in the wealthy progressive cluster um, would also need to, you know, do well enough in the black cluster and well enough in the white moderate cluster to be able to put together a win. Um, I think we certainly have candidates who, who you know, are, are trying to define a lane and and trying to um, trying to optimize on those groups where they think uh, their base is. You know, I think every candidate would tell you that they're trying to win across the city, but certainly there are candidates who. You know, we'll plausibly do get 40% of the vote in the wealthy progressive cluster, and then you know, getting 10% in the black voter cluster would be enough to put them over over the finish line. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so, and and I think the candidates uh, have certainly in their campaign, campaigns have certainly been behaving this way. Uh, there's an awful lot of, of of wiggle room, or maybe more, more, more than wiggle room, on just on, on in terms of persuasion, trying to persuade voters from one block or another to, to swing that the swing their way. As as you noted, I guess there's you know there may be a given candidate or candidates who just who may not reach a certain block, but there are other portions uh, that they try to reach out to. And I guess with the the two uh, independent polls that that have been put out, there seventy did, did one of them. Um, there are, there are apparently a, a great many voters who are undecided, and consequently they've been um, getting a lot of literature and, and seeing a lot of ads on TV and social media and, and elsewhere. So, um, I, yeah, I, I'm sure Jonathan, I would ask if I were asked, do you, do you have do you have in your head a, an idea about who's going to win this thing? I'm sure I'm sure you'd probably be not not sure about that. I, I know that I'm I'm hesitant to make any guesses because it is it is going to be close. Yeah, I mean the polls we've all seen have really been statistical dead heats among. Um, really four of the candidates, Helen Gim, uh, Rebecca Reinhart, Sheryl Parker, and Alan Dom. I'm pretty sure I'm not missing anyone. Um, (laughs) And it's really a statistical dead heat. Now, um, I really, it's hard to deploy polls these days. And so I, I sort of can't imagine exactly how a poller would be confident that they got those weights right. So I think, um, you know, we'll, we'll know the real answer in, in about 10 hours. So Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and obviously again for you folks at home, if you haven't voted yet, get get on in there uh, to your point place and, and get get that vote in. If you have your mail-in ballot, re- return that. Uh, every vote will every vote always does matter, but especially when you have real choices to make. And here in Philly, uh, you really do. You you want to have uh, you want to have your say in this in this matter. Uh, one one final question, uh, Jonathan. Then we'll let you go. So um, this is a a big Democratic field in, in the primary. Of course, here in Philly. Uh, with more than seven Democrats for everyone Republican, it is the Democratic primary, you know, al- almost always that determines uh, who enters, enters who enters public office. In other parts of the state, it's the other way around. It's a Republican primary who eventually becomes uh, uh, who, en- who enters public office. So, in this case, and because it is it's such a high profile office, right? You're an executive of uh, of our local government. Um, it spurred some amount of discussion uh, around you know whether our kind of traditional first past the post voting system 
uh, is is the best way to go. We've had the system for for basically generations. It's it is it is fairly straightforward. If, if only because we've been using it forever. Uh, but there are all, there are all sorts of other ways to do elections. Um, and actually, I think in Philly or in Pennsylvania or even here in the United States, we could we forget the fact uh, that uh, you can do this all sorts of different ways. So, I mean, what's what's your general take on this discussion? And do you, do you have any uh, uh, favorite systems that you, if you could again, if you could wave a magic wand, we might we might shift or consider shifting to. Yeah. Um, yeah. So just you know, agreeing with you, you know, the winner will probably get about 30% of the vote. Um, and so we'll have a mayor who, who only won 30% of the vote. Now, um, a lot of those candidates would have, uh, uh, the winner probably would have done a lot better than 30% if we had something like an instant runoff. So just because someone got 30% doesn't mean, you know, 70% of the city uh, is, is against them. But um yeah, I think basically any other system that involves some kind of runoff would would be better than this first past the post. Um, I'm not an expert in the field, but mm -hmm. Chicago has a runoff system. So we saw that they had a competitive mayoral primary. And in fact, the um, the the candidate who won the first round, uh, Paul Vallis, who we, uh, who we all know as the former superintendent, did not win the, the second round. So um, so actually lost in the runoff. Um, so that that's that's a, a, a an actual runoff where you actually have to hold two elections. Now these days, you know, we have more complicated ballots, and you can actually do something like ranked choice voting, where in the first election people rank their um, rank their candidates, and then if your first choice gets eliminated, your vote gets automatically switched to the second choice. So we don't actually have to go through the rigmarole of setting up two elections. Um, yeah, I really think. Yeah. Well, point. I mean, point. Point well taken. That like the status quo is not serving uh, serving the city very well. It's probably been that been that way for a while. Uh, of course, we at seventy right now are are advocating for in, in Harrisburg changing state law so that independent voters, unaffiliated voters, can at least choose one primary ballot or or the other. Um, but as you mentioned, like right choice voting is an option. Um, uh, approval voting, uh, which which I I've, I've put out there a couple of times, and actually St. Louis is only is the only other major city that that uses. Uh, has has been broached. Um, so I think on the other side of this election, it'd be it'd be worth probably a more serious discussion about what the options could be and you know what those options would be in our hormone charter uh, here in Philly uh, that city council could execute on what what options we'd have to go through Harrisburg and state law for. So, uh, Jonathan, I think that's all the time we have uh, today. Thanks so much for joining us. And again, uh, what's what, what the blog uh, website so, so folks can go check out the turnout tracker. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the turnout tracker, you can watch it at 66wards.com. Just click on turnout tracker. Most importantly, that also gives you a link to submit your data. So as you vote, ask for your voter number, then log in and tell me what your voter number is. And, and we can collectively uh, watch turnout go up through the day. All right. Thanks, everybody. Go vote. Give Jonathan some data. Some data. See ya.